phones never got boring. I'm kind of riffing on this one. I had a, another plan to put out a different video today, but I got into this conversation on threads. I posted something really spicy on threads. Maybe I should back off a little from threads because the, the posts that generate the most engagement also, you know, they can be some of our more divisive conversations, but it's a refrain that I've been seeing crop up just a little bit more as we get into this early launch of phones for 2024. But it just seems that Samsung has gotten their big announcement out for the beginning of the year. All of the tools that we have to track trending topics and analytics, seeing a pretty steep drop off from the announcement of the S24 series of phones. And that seems to bring a refrain from a number of tech reviewers and tech journalists that, well, problem is smartphones have plateaued, capped, nowhere else we can go from here. I'm not particularly interested in a semantics debate over the word plateaued. I think instead we see a general trend that when Apple or Samsung content underperforms for journalists and reviewers, there's a reaction to make claims like, smartphones have plateaued. It's a quirk of the review process where we expect the videos on those two brands to basically subsidize our channels and bring in the revenue and get those affiliate clicks because they're popular topics. Those two companies spend the most on advertising and that should increase their reach on social media and everybody gets paid especially if you have any special access to those companies and you can get pre-release hardware, early access, it's even better. That means you'll have less competition for your videos and articles when you publish before consumers receive their pre-orders. That early spike of traffic and interest is the most valuable period to be talking about these products. But the Galaxy S24 was announced Samsung Unpacked was pretty low energy. There was very little to say about the phones and a lot to show on AI services that will likely be available on all Android devices after a short window of exclusivity on galaxies and pixels, a new era of mobile AI. So we look at our analytics and we look at our channel stats, we see the trends, a brief spike of search interest, and then the trendiness of that topic plummets. Social media and search algorithms are already squeezing out that content before pre-orders have really started shipping. If you're just starting to join the conversation now, the platforms are already working against you. But if you were in the early access ring and this content isn't quite delivering what you wanted, you can't point blank say, Samsung let me down. My videos aren't making as much cash. They're not getting as much traffic. You have to code that frustration. If Samsung is a topic, can't move the needle on my metrics, well, uh, smartphones. Uh, smartphones have plateaued. That's the problem. Plateaued means there's nowhere left to go. And that's just not true. We do need disruption in the mobile space, but that won't come if we continue to grade Apple and Samsung as the default options. And we begrudgingly acknowledge when other companies do some good competitive work, we guess. A company makes a great phone, but they don't spend billions a year on marketing their brand. Somehow, that phone is just never quite as good as the Galaxy or the iPhone. Ah, just better luck next time. And tech reviewers and journalists are letting their audiences down by avoiding conversations about novelty and practical computing. They wield this phrase, average consumers like a shield. What will the average consumer get out of this new phone while they also talk about the most expensive phones of the year. The Galaxy S24 series will likely make up less than 10% of Samsung's total phone sales. And that's three models of phone, the S24, S24 Plus, and S24 Ultra. In what way would we consider 10% of a market average? But when, but when techies and reviewers invoke that phrase, they can crouch behind a really basic idea of phone use that everyone generally understands. And the viewer 
can insert their use into that empty phrase and they can feel good about not being average. I don't believe there is a thing as an average consumer, everyone has unique needs for picking up some kind of pocket computer. It's not a demographic that exists or can be measured or can be tracked. It endures because it means a lot of reviewers don't need to do more than just show the manufacturer's talking points from the reviewer guide with some crispy B-roll. I'm using this phone like some kind of average consumer, but also smartphones have plateaued. That does encapsulate one issue consumers have with novelty. We used to be entertained just by a phone's existence. A little trip down memory lane. I was a huge fan of mini computer PDA phones like this HTC. It had a 3G radio and a screen that was twice the resolution of the iPhone and expandable storage and a cute little slider keyboard. I could install tons of apps and games long before Apple invented the App Store. This was a monster pocket computer, but it was also a mobile build of Windows. So it was a little clumsy. The menus were really ugly and some of the features were confusing to get to. As we were getting consumers introduced to pocket computer phones, something as novel as slide to unlock was an experience people had never seen before. Either coming from a PDA on the techie side, the nerd side, or coming from a feature or a flip phone on the general consumer cell phone side. I'm sure a significant number of early iPhone adopters were entertained just by the existence of the iPhone, the slide to unlock, the smooth scrolling of menus. It was fun just to hold it and use it before they went any deeper to use the more advanced features on the iPhone. Unlock it, turn it off, scroll, repeat. That novelty was ecstatic. But the smartphone has matured and what was once an exclusive object of desire and novelty is now a required companion. The smartphone is an appliance, not a status symbol. I don't care how invested you are in blue bubbles, you're not showing anyone status with your phone. But maturing is not the same as plateauing. And we're facing an incredible number of challenges in the world today. And it's more important than ever that we have good tools to host and join new conversations about issues. We're, we're fighting a war with social media over the value of our memories. And phones are now the first tool most people reach for to capture those memories. There's still plenty of room to disrupt and evolve with a collection of new and older technologies for our phones. We just need to see manufacturers brave enough to start stepping on other product segments. We're seeing some critically exciting improvements in mobile photography, far more exciting than a single number score grade can explain to consumers. And we don't feel bad that phones have basically decimated the point and shoot camera market. There's still plenty of room to improve on mobile optics and sensors. Reviewers need to be able to tell that story though. If we're only shooting on new phones the way we shot on old phones, then consumers never get to see how much farther you can push a phone camera every year. Reviewers rush to detail all the upgrades we get to performance and gaming and the new CPU and the new GPU, but we rarely see practical demonstrations of what more compute power means. All we seem capable of showcasing is a bigger number score than last year, which means nothing and does not predict real world performance. So what is a consumer going to do with an Antutu score? Yet tech enthusiasts are the first to argue with me when I show things like a video editing test. Now, who's gonna do that from a phone? That's a thing for real computers to do. But when I show my family and friends that they can trim up a video or add some clips together, slap some music on it, they try it and a lot of them like it and they can quickly cut up video directly on the camera that shot the video 
immediately after they shot the video. I'm often told average consumers care more about gaming tests, that it's, it's more important to see uh, thermal throttling on Genshin Impact. And I just don't see the math to support that. Genshin's peak player day in December of 2023 was 12 million players. I can't find a good breakdown on platforms, but we know mobile does not account for 100% of Genshin's player base. Taking the most popular video sharing site right now, TikTok averages 30 million video uploads a day. Again, not all of those are from mobile and not all are edited, at least not in a traditional sense, but it's an app with a particular mobile focus and a mobile audience. Many, many more people are sharing videos than playing graphics-rich games on their phones. And a lot of those folks sharing videos don't yet know how much better the video editing tools on phones could be. Reviewers don't talk about stuff like that with any kind of consistency. And tech enthusiasts shrug off those conversations as you know, the gaming conversation is a bit more accessible to see you know, the improvements year over year, and they just like seeing screen recordings of the games they like to play. And don't even get me started on things like desktop modes for our phones. The newest chips from MediaTek and Qualcomm, if we believe synthetic benchmarks, are starting to rival 12th gen Intel laptop processors and are able to compete well at significantly lower power draw. There's no good reason why a phone today couldn't be someone's home computer or laptop. The hardware, the processing power has not been holding us back for years now. We just need a little more help getting developers on board to bring us the software and services to make use of all of this compute power that we get year over year in the phone market. Oh, but the market. The market demands those of us in more developed or Western countries own multiple computers with overlapping functionality. Maybe just divide it up by screen size, but they're all kind of capable of doing the same stuff. You know, the saddest part of this, in areas where folks might only be able to afford up to a mid-ranger phone, that phone is still likely more powerful than a student-grade Chromebook or laptop. But we don't give that mid-ranger phone the tools to connect to other accessories like monitors or TVs. There's no reason why you should have separate communication and compute devices when they're generally about the same level of compute performance. But a phone manufacturer would need to be comfortable stepping on other product segments and advertising that those features exist. That manufacturer would need to see that including a desktop mode and video output and these accessories are actually generating more sales. We create mountains of e-waste because of bad design decisions in, previous, in the previous years of companies fighting initiatives like right to repair. But there's an opportunity on the horizon to disrupt simply by giving us back some of the things we've lost on our pocket computers. Manufacturers are gonna wait until the last possible minute to give us back easily removable batteries. You know, the, the EU is mandating that we can make that repair on our own. We know every manufacturer there will look for some kind of loophole to make a battery replacement more of a pain point. A company could come out today make a big marketing campaign out of how they're beating other brands to the punch, getting ahead of the regulations. They care about their customers and the environment, but so far, crickets. If we get removable batteries back, there's less incentive to sell a bunch of different chargers and mounts and coils and chi and MagSafe and accessories that, that they help us maintain our battery anxiety. The new Galaxy Ultra, the most expensive phone that Samsung sells, can charge from 0 to 60% in, in around a half hour. But in the past, if you invested in a spare battery, you could charge from 0 to full in the time it would take you to reboot your phone. This is a time to reflect on different features and different configurations. Maybe it is nice being able to upgrade the storage of a phone, you know, even if it's just for media storage, just to back up your camera roll. Maybe the headphone jack hasn't really outlived its usefulness, 
or at the very least, we should get two USB ports, which would help expand the use of a pocket computer and minimize wear and tear on an individual charge port. We're leaving so much cool tech on the table for, for manufacturers to slowly portion out these other upgrades. And to Apple and Samsung specifically, there's, there's no plateauing. There's plenty of ways they can improve their premium, but not ultra tier devices. Better and brighter screens, better camera tech, uh, bigger battery capacities, faster charging. We know they can make better phones under $1,000 because there's a lot of competition on sub $1,000 phones that are using these better parts. And you can't claim to be a market leader and sell better components to your competition for them to use at lower unit prices. Plateauing is a toxic term for our hobby because it's most employed by people monetizing their videos and articles. And it's an easy, it's a pithy phrase to repeat by fans of those channels and outlets. It's built on a casual relationship to popularity and the fallacy that Samsung and Apple must be the best because they sell the most. That's not a practical examination of actual devices that's just supporting the bias of people who want to hear nice things said about the products they already own. I don't know, maybe the right car for your needs is actually a Hyundai, but you've always shopped a Toyota, so you just gotta keep buying a Toyota until they give you all the features that you want and are already available on the Hyundai. It just doesn't make sense to me to keep doing business with companies out of some kind of blind brand loyalty. It makes sense to shop around, and that also tells the manufacturer you used to like that they're not doing the things that you want. The smartphone isn't the dramatic ecstatic novelty that it used to be. It's, it's a mature companion tech appliance. But with that market maturity, it's on us to drive the conversations deeper. The phone isn't entertaining like it used to be just by itself. It doesn't tickle you just by existing and having smooth menu scrolling. But now you actually have a choice in this market that you did not have before. The excitement, the new, is in you. If you want to try doing new and more exciting things from your phone, there are very good reasons to buy increasingly more expensive phones. But if you're buying a new phone just to replace an old phone, and you're confident that you're not gonna extend, that you're not really gonna try to do new things with it, then you should be able to get comparable technology to your older phone at a much lower price. It's sort of an upgrade in place. That's also not plateauing. That's the result of properly acknowledging good competition, properly acknowledging that you have choices. And we have to mean it when we say things like, vote with your wallet. It's the only message these companies really hear. I feel like such a broken record right now. This point, I feel like I have to keep reiterating because um, part, YouTube does a terrible job of handling all the older videos I've made, uh, hosting a similar conversation. But I think this is a pretty easy pattern to observe. We seem to have this chat every time Samsung or Apple deliver an underwhelming product. There are really interesting tech developments evolving all around us. You just gotta look around a bit. Maybe take a half step outside your comfort zone. They're not hard to find. So I've been rambling on long enough. I'm gonna go ahead and put a pin in this right now. I'd love to hear some thoughts. What is it about the next phase of mobile technology, of portable computing, where do you think we go from here and what can we do to spruce up these pocket computers that apparently have completely plateaued? We just have nowhere left that we can go with them. I find that argument to be so reductive and just shows such a lack of understanding of what it takes to bring a product to market, but I digress. As always, thanks so much for watching, sharing, subscribing. I love being able to get this stuff off my chest and have these conversations with you fine folks. And I'll be back with some other really topical phone versus phone comparison videos very soon, so stay tuned. Please consider supporting the channel by joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen. That's from my Patreon. These are basically the coolest tech pals in the universe, so I hope you'll check them out. And you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet. 
probably taking a break from threads now, <laughs> but you can find me a little bit more just having conversations, reasonable conversations over on the Mastodons. And I will catch you all on the next video.